And I, I'm a staff at the Center for Integrated Agricultural Systems, which is a mouthful, but uh, it's a center at UW-Madison. Um, I also am director of the Wisconsin School for Beginning Dairy and Livestock Farmers. There's brochures in there. We start class uh, on Halloween this year. Um, so it's part of the UW short course program on campus, the Farm Industry short course program, and we teach pasture-based ag um, both on campus and online. So if you're interested in that or you have any uh, farmers that you work with that might be interested, come talk to me. Um, but the purpose of today, um, we're discussing how does organic management on dairy farms affect pastures and soils, um, among other topics. But basically, this is a grant that we got at UW-Madison um, from Organic Valley, the FAFO, Farmers Advocating for Organics. And it's a three-year grant. And it's um, the, all the FAFO grant opportunities are chosen by farmers. So it's not the Organic Valley staff doing it, but rather farmers on a board that come together and decide what they think is important. And one of the things they thought was important was to train the trainers. So essentially to get people out on organic farms to learn more about organic farming and pasture management and soils. And so that's why we're here today. And this is actually the last one in a series. We had two last fall and we're having two this fall. Um, the first year of the project though, just to back up a little bit, culminated in um, a actual peer-reviewed journal article that I don't have with me today, but that will be provided on our website. And also this research brief, which is a summary of that journal article that was written by professors on campus and uh, a grad student. And the question that we wanted to answer for Organic Valley and for ourselves was basically, um, is there any evidence out there that organic uh, dairy farming is gonna produce different um, management strategies and soil health for farmers than conventional. And there's not a lot of information out there, organic versus conventional pastures, actually. Not a lot of peer-reviewed journal articles, probably a lot of anecdotal mm. evidence, but um, not, <laughs> not a lot out there. So this discusses that. So if you want to learn more about that, this is the, this is the journal article that um, was put into a research brief by Ruth McNair over here at our center, and it's in there for you to read. Um, but I'm just going to read the very end of it because I find it interesting. There's a quote from the um, the grad student who wrote this, the literature on organic pasture management is sparse. We found some evidence from the scientific literature that organic management can stimulate soil life, but a lack of conclusive evidence for productivity differences between organic and conventional pastures. So this, mind you, this is organic research. This isn't what people are finding out on their farms, perhaps. Um, thus, the researchers recommend that organic dairy producers employ established principles of managed grazing to maintain pasture productivity. This includes rotating livestock frequently through paddocks, so that biomass and so that plants are uniformly grazed with significant residual biomass and time for growth, regrowth. So that's something that we'll be talking about today. These techniques are critical on organic farms where synthetic fertilizers and herbicides cannot be used to address the effects of overgrazing. More research on organic pastures and soils and conditions typical of the upper Midwest is needed to improve understanding and development recommendations about managing organic pastures to enhance pasture productivity and soil life. So a lot of the research that's in here did not take place in the Midwest that was able to be dug up. New Zealand, Europe, other places. So this is important, something to address in the Midwest for us. Um, and yeah, so without further ado, I wanna thank the Center for Integrated Agricultural Systems, North Central SARE, um, Organic Valley, and UW Extension for helping with these events. Um, some monetarily and, and with bodies here, as you can see, Mark Kopecki and Greg Brickner are here today, um, former Organic Valley and current Organic Valley employees. So um, thanks to them and thanks to Jeff Brink, who is our first speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Jeff Brink uh, is also retired, um, but from the USDA Dairy Forage Research Center as an agronomist. Um, he also happens to be one of my grad school advisors, so um, I was very proud to work with him and, and learn about rotational grazing in a research setting. I had worked on some farms, and so doing actual research in that was, was really important to learning more about how the ecosystem works. <laughs> and that's my son, Charlie, who loves the tractor. <laughs> but, so Dr. Brink, do you want to come up here? His talk today is Pasture Establish and Pasture Establishment and Renovation. On, on pastures, also extending the grazing season, talk about outwintering some and perhaps some annuals, but he encourages you to ask questions and you all have a handout, so thank yes, you. Yes, please, I encourage you to, uh, <laughs> to ask questions as, as I move through this. Um, 
this is a really informal setting and I asked her about whether we were going to have a, a slide projector and a screen we were going to be in a barn and she said no this is going to be just discussion I thought that's great because that creates an environment where it's a lot easier to ask questions and interact with the people who, who have the, the questions she as, as I mentioned she asked or as she mentioned she asked me to talk about renovation um, and uh, extending the winter the uh, grazing season and I think of the of the two topics that I did research on when I was with USDA, the first one was grazing management. Uh, that was probably the result of the most questions and and, and the most uh, interest in my research. And the second one was, was renovation. Um, I have often heard it said that we have, how long have we been talking about renovating pastures? Just forever. And when I was 30 years ago, when I started working in Mississippi, their, their whole, idea about raising beef was, was centered on renovating their pastures and improving them and adding adding improved species and you know this how many years later we're we're still talking about renovating pastures introducing new species and and uh, trying to improve the quality and, and the, the uh, support of the livestock on those pastures I want to say one word about soil health before I get into the idea of renovation um, and, and adding uh, adding species to a pasture. Um, right before I left, last two years I was there, two and a half, I had a graduate student named Chelsea Ziegler, and she did a, 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 a study at, at, at Prairie du Sac on, on pasture where we would, um, and I'll just go through the treatments real quickly, basically we had several grasses and, and, and we introduced uh, five different, four, excuse me, four different legumes to those pastures in, in separate blocks. And, and then we had different grazing treatments, either very intensive, what we call mob stocking, or typical rotational uh, stocking, or no stocking. We, we essentially hayed those. We cut those pastures, uh, uh, those blocks, uh, either when the grass was mature or when it was very short in vegetative stage. And we looked at soil health throughout the whole, throughout the whole experiment, the beginning of the grazing season throughout, and at the end of the grazing uh, season, and we measured soil health by the um, by the by a method of where you parse out the, the, the fungi and the bacteria, and it's been a year now, so I even forgot the term. Mark, do you know what that it was? A PLFA. PLFA. Thank you very much. It was a PLFA uh, assay where we looked at, at all those different species that were in the in the soil, and what really shocked me was the biggest change. Well, let, let me ask you first. Who who would guess? What would you guess a treatment that would affect the soil health in terms of the fungi and bacterial populations the most? We'll say stocking rate, animals, or legumes. Anybody like to take a guess? <coughs> animals. Just the fact that you're grazing it would add, you're adding manure and it, you'd have the most effect on the soil bacterial population, fungi. Anybody else? Legumes, okay. Anybody else? No? You're right. It didn't really matter whether you had animals there or not, or whether you mob stocked or rotationally grazed it when you did have animals. The biggest change in the bacterial and the fungal population came simply by adding a legume. Didn't matter what legume? Nope. We used trefoil, we used red clover, we used alfalfa, and white clover, all separate. Now, I will say that the biggest change, <laughs> numerically, because, uh, because this, this assay is really variable all over the place, um, alfalfa really had the numeric, the best, uh, the highest change, simply because it has the biggest root mass and the largest amount of above ground uh, mass that's produced during the growing season. So that addition of that legume and the nitrogen fixation that comes from that legume had the biggest impact. Uh, but all the legumes had a had a had a, an impact on the on the soil health. So they might not know this, but they got that as a digital resource and their packet of resources that I just brought out. Oh, okay. You have your email address, but you didn't get it for your email down. You email. Okay. You so today. that's a great segue yeah. to. When people ask me, yeah, yes, sir. I am massively interested in this. If you got an established like pioneer sod pasture, yes. how do you introduce something like that into that kind of deep rooted environment? You're, 
Uh, yes, uh, if you have a well-established sod, and you're saying just such as out here, maybe it's a, or you think about a warm season or a cool season sod. Ours was established where we can't even plow on it because it's like pioneer sod. It's old. Okay, so it's a very old sod, and you wish to introduce a legume, let's for example, uh, or or let's introduce a different grass as well, or some additional species to that sod, and how you want to do that. Okay, so my, my I'm going to answer that question as I... If I could take out one weed for every leg, it might be great, but tell me how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, th and that also brings, in the back of my mind, when you ask a question like that, is, is, the, is the, the idea that we are working with, an, I presume, an organic environment. Yes, Since no? Since my renters didn't invest anything into the property except cow pats, I'd say it's organic. Okay. So, in an organic setting, if you're truly organic, then you're restricted to what, how you can renovate that pasture. In other words, if you've got a lot of weeds, you can't pull out a, a, a five-gallon bucket of 2,4-D. We're not restricted. It's just what, how it happened. Yeah. Okay. So, let me get to that. Right. So, the importance of, of, of the research that Chelsea did was, was basically showing that of, of all, the, all the management renovation or the renovation techniques we can employ, probably adding a legume is going to be the most effective way of improving pasture quality and livestock nutrition. All right, a legume hands down. And, and one of the best, if you can do it, and in the packet uh, of, of the, that came from that Nadia handed out, um, are some advantages and disadvantages of, of legumes in, in terms of their introduction or their renovation value to a pasture system. Um, alfalfa is the queen of forages, literally, for a number of reasons. But it's also the queen because it requires a lot of maintenance. Um, you cannot, you cannot uh, uh, plant alfalfa into a, into a pasture and overgraze it or have it lie under water for half of uh, the season <laughs> or have an acidic subsoil or, or have a, a, a potassium and phosphorus level that are 10 parts per million. You need fertility, you need drainage, and you need pH to support alfalfa. So that's that's one of the advantages and disadvantages of that, that crop. And you can see in that in the handout where uh, in that table that some of the advantages and disadvantages of each of those legumes. But let me go back to just some guidelines that, that I like to, when people say I want to renovate my pasture and, it, and it's an organic setting, and I'm going to assume it's in, in this case where we talk about organic. Um, and the, the very first thing to do is what you have in your pasture right now has been growing there and it probably doing quite well for quite a while. And those are the grass species that are adapted to your farm and they are suited to the soil and the climate on that farm. And to introduce a new species, whether it's grass or legume, you have to literally beat back the competition from that grass or legume. And the, and the cheapest way to do that is with your cows. And the best time to do it is starting right about now. We're in that, we're in that time frame where if you're thinking, I want to renovate my pastures and introduce a legume, whether of any kind of legume, white clover, alfalfa, or red clover, trefoil, cura clover, if you want to introduce a legume next spring, then you need to start now or even before now, basically. But you want to graze that grass so intensively that its regrowth next spring is slowed by the fact that it was overgrazed this spring, or excuse me, this fall. That's the most important thing you can do to a pasture to, to get it ready for, uh, for renovation. Then, and then that's the first comment, or the first, first most important principle is, is that um, is that you want to make sure you reduce that competition. And then next spring, I liken it to a poker game. If any of you played <laughs> poker, um, you have a probability, you, you have better probability of, of winning in a poker, of course, the better cards you're holding, all right? You have a better probability of success with renovation and that means if you're going to buy a bag of legume seed, which is not inexpensive, and you're going to seed it, I respect the farmer who says, I just want to use a four-wheeler and spread it on the 
top of the ground and frost seed it. And, and if that's what you want to do, but you're only holding a pair of twos, <laughs> all right? <laughs> you might be holding a pair of tens if everything really, really works well. But you realize that the number of seed you throw out there, let's say it's three to four pounds an acre uh, of, uh, of, of seed, that can be anywhere from a couple hundred thousand to almost a million when, when you're throwing out really small seed. A very large proportion of those seed are not going to germinate, all right, because they simply are not, do not have enough seed soil contact. And you might not want me to hear me say this, Brian might want me to hear me say this, because drilling or putting, the concept of putting that seed in contact with the soil is one of the most important things you can do when you renovate and introduce a new legume or a new grass. There's no getting around it. It's cheaper to do it other ways, but again, the poker game is, is you want the best hand you hold you can hold, and that is to drill that seed in. And furthermore, if you want to have an even better poker hand, is to do that as soon as you possibly can in the springtime. Because remember, those grasses How that are soon. What? How soon? How soon? As soon as you get, as soon as the soil's off. Our very best success we ever had was the, so we had grazed the previous year, so the grass was this short. And the last, excuse me, the first week in March, when all the snow was gone, and the ground was frozen, and the grass was brown, and there wasn't anything growing. We put weights on a tie drill, and we drilled it in starting at 6 a.m., and when the sun came up in about 10, 10 a.m. is when, as soon as we saw any moisture on the tractor tires, we quit. Because then, the double disc openers and the coulters are, will start accumulating mud, which, you want that soil, you want that sod to break, you know, Basically, you want the double disc openers. There, still had frost on the ground. Yes, yeah. it was still frozen. We left no tracks when, when we drove over with the tractor. Um, this was a tractor smaller than that, but, Whatever, yeah. but it was, you know. And you went with a no-till drill. With a no-till drill. Well, and, you answered all my questions, guys, and I'll go now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if, if we're good, I'm, we're done. <laughs> so, and, 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 what we observed in that case was we looked and in the coulter, the what, double disc what, opener. How many, how many seeds is the push from? How many pounds of the acre were you seeding? We were seeding five pounds of the acre of all of our legumes. You could see it. Yes, we could see. Have you ever tried going heavier? Yes. And you couldn't, there's no difference. That, um, if you do it right, I don't think it's necessary to go seven or eight or nine or 10, <laughs> if you do it right. So, it looks like anything gets done right around here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you want to do it with the best probability of success. There is no right or wrong in, in terms of, well, there is wrong, but I mean, it, there's varying degrees of right, okay? Do you use a mixture of legumes or what? So I've been on a number of farms where they do use a mixture of, of legumes, um, <coughs> and most of the time it'll be red, white, and alfalfa. Spread the bets. <laughs> spread your bets around and, and some have alfalfa is going to be more persistent during the winter uh, or excuse me in the summer it grows better during the middle of summer um, what about auto toxicity uh, boy, about it? boy. Right, can you uh, yes the question is about auto toxicity I'm um, forgive me for not repeating no, every okay, single yeah, question um, there has to be a fair amount of alfalfa remaining in the, in the soil, or excuse me, in the pasture before you're going to see an autotoxic effect on new seedlings. Okay. And, and most of the time that is, I think those are the producers that have seeded a monoculture of alfalfa it, and, and they wish to go back and drill back more alfalfa. And in that case, you, you often will have. But in a, in a setting, in a pasture setting where you have grasses and, and legumes growing together, that's, that shouldn't be a problem, autotoxicity. So to get back to your question, the earlier the better. And um, two things, put the seed in contact with the soil. And again, make sure that grass has been 
suppressed the previous year because the thing is, even in that situation where we seeded into a, a frozen ground, when that soil thawed out, you could see the little seedlings come up, but a week later, the grass was this tall. Yeah. And it's coming out of the ground really fast, even when it's been suppressed the previous year. <coughs> so you want to create that environment where you give those, chance, those seedlings the best chance of, of surviving. And so that, that also means it's probably not a good idea to make hay on that field for a first crop. You want to start. What about grazing? How slow do you start grazing? So our, our idea on, on those, and these, we had set these, this area up for an experiment. We, put, we turned cattle in and grazed it when it was about eight inches tall. The seedlings? No, the grass. Okay. Six to eight inches tall, the grass. Yep. And, and so we wanted to get that competition off. And we did that. And I don't see anything wrong with it because normally from a pasture management, I wouldn't suggest this. But from the perspective of establishing a, a legume in a renovated pasture and giving that legume the best chance of persisting both the first year, second and third, because after all, that's what you want. You want that legume to be there for at least two to three years. Then you want it in the first year, you want to make sure you keep the competition between it and the grass down at least through the first half of the grazing season. That's my, that's my perspective. And you don't have to worry about, like, I don't know how it's, the comp, not competition, but the cows stomping on that. Cows stomp. And ruining that. Compaction. That's what my biggest concerns always about. So if it's wet, then yes. So that as soon as it's, you throw in that variable, I would say, yeah, you have to watch it. But if, it's, if, if the soil will support a cow in your normal rotation, then you're far better off grazing it a little more frequently and keeping the competition down during the first half of the grazing season. Because that's the critical time for, for any of these legume seedlings is to get up and get going. Okay? So... Um, what about grasses? Yeah, I mean, you, you just... <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> People in the audience like you. That was my segue. So we did, a, we did another experiment where we introduced grasses, in particular, meadow fescue. And Randy Jackson came to me a long, long time ago. You tell people who he is in case they don't know. Uh, Randy Jackson is a, is a forage ecologist, if you will, at, at University yeah, of Wisconsin, grass, yeah, grass, grass ecologist. Yeah. And he said, um, meadow fescue is great stuff, obviously. <laughs> great, great nutritive value, uh, it persists, um, but can we, can we introduce it into a, into a, 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 a reno, can we renovate a pasture, an existing pasture with, with meadow fescue um, and, and really improve that, improve that pasture? So we did, that, we did that experiment a little bit differently in that we went into a full tillage renovation because we wanted to give the grass, we, we wanted this to be, um, essentially a no competition experiment initially. I'll tell you about where we did introduce it, and it drilled it. But in this case, we, we introduced uh, on six farms and we started on the Cates farm. And if you've, forgive me if you've already heard part of this talk. Uh, we started on the Cates farm and we went about 50 mile increments all the way up to the Mark Kopecky uh, uh, farm, no. I'm sorry. It was further north than it was. It was, it was in Medford. Uh, yeah, it was right, right, right near the Tamandel farm. Oh, I can't remember his name. Glen Harder? No. It, but, anyways, if you know where the, the Tamandel farm is, between the Tamandel farm and the Cates farm, there were six farms, and we went just north, and we went to each one of those farms, and we wanted to see if if meadow fescue would perform as well as what they had on their existing farm and would it persist under their grazing management. And we destroyed the sod uh, that they had and we planted a mixture of tall fescue and, and orchard grass. We thought that was a fairly good mixture. Um, and so meadow fescue and orchard grass or tall fescue? Meadow, meadow fescue. fescue. Okay. okay. No yeah, tall I fescue. Just to, whoa, whoa, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll get back to that. So we used, we used meadow fescue and, and orchard grass. And 
basically, after four years, most of those farms went back to what they had growing before. That the meadow fescue, if it was going to persist in that environment, if the, so if the soil would support it and the climate would support it, and most of those conditions were in the south, the, in the southern part of the state, the Cates farm, uh, and one farm north of that. Um, and then there was a farm near River Falls, it, it supported meadow fescue quite well. But in this case, in, 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 in the case of meadow fescue, when we got up here, where bluegrass and orchard grass, uh, well, even further north than here, bluegrass and orchard grass were pretty much the dominant species, then meadow fescue didn't survive. So the idea of introducing grasses, and, and I'm gonna say this, let me go back to legumes real quickly. I consider legumes a temporary citizen of the pasture. They are probably not gonna be there forever unless it's a white clover dominant area, uh, a river bottom that really supports a certain legume really well. But most of our legumes are not as long term as our grasses. They just don't persist as long. But grasses, on the other hand, we want them to be permanent. We don't want to keep going back and seeding perennial grasses year after year or even every two or three years. So my point is, is that the climate and the soil are going to have the most impact on the success of renovating a pasture and introducing a new grass. And so my, my, my suggestion is if you're going to do that, is to follow all the principles of, of renovation that I talked about with legumes, and then drill a grass into it early as you can in the springtime. And again, remember, you're talking about a grass seedling that's gonna have to compete with what you have out there. And using, I wouldn't plant any more in a bag of seed. I'd, I'd maybe do a couple acres and see if this grass is gonna grow in the long term. And if it's not, it'll be gone in two or three years. <laughs> You just don't want to seed 30 or 40 acres with an improved grass, no matter who tells you how good it is, me or anybody else, you want to make sure that the investment is going to pay off. And certain grasses are going to do really well in certain places and others are not going to survive very well. And so I just can't make the recommendation that meadow fescue is going to work all over the state of Wisconsin because it doesn't. Is there a guide or a map or something that shows where what Brian, does is there a well map? for different parts of Wisconsin? Is there a, Actually, yeah, right on more, the... It's more based on soils. It's soils is the those. predominant factor, the influence. We tend to like to put it on heavier, wetter soils. Right. What was that, Brian? We tend to like to put it on wetter Metal soils. Metal fescue works really well on heavier soils. Yeah. yeah. So, Mark, you That's really interesting that it didn't persist when I first got to my farm in Catawba. There was an old hay field there that had been in for I don't know how long. And there was a grass growing there that I didn't recognize, but it seemed like it was a pretty decent forage. And so I bundled some of it up and I sent it down to Mike Kasler and I said, what the heck is this? And he said, that's meadow fescue. Yeah. So that, maybe it was that variety that had been adapted to that area or something, I'm not sure. So that is the other thing that, that Mike Kasler, who's a breeder, grass breeder to Dairy Forage Research Center, has found that there are ecotypes all over the state that have been there for a long, long time, and some of them came over, literally came over when Wisconsin was settled, when Europeans, because there's some really, really fancy genetic testing we can do now with, with the, uh, the DNA and RNA in, in, from, uh, in, the, in the chlorophyll, and those plants that, for example, that were on uh, uh, across southwestern Wisconsin trace back to places in Italy and, and the Caucasus Mountains in, in Russia. So that stuff came over very early and, and I, I found when I was up north, you know, I took some plants back to him and he said, well, it doesn't look like it, but it is metal fescue. So it, yeah, that's, that's a good case. So that's, again, when you, when you renovate with grasses and, and we did, I'm gonna go back to, to renovation into an existing pasture. We did the same thing we, for legumes we grazed it really, really tight. It was about inch to two inches going into the winter um, and drilled the meadow fescue in. The difference when you drill a grass into an existing grass sod, you may not see it 
the whole first year because we did not see any meadow fescue in a typical orchard grass, bluegrass, smooth grown grass rate, pasture. Couple pounds the acre, two, three pounds. We seeded about, in that case about eight pounds of the acre. And we didn't see, we didn't see anything, anything the, first the first year until the very end when we had grazed off at the end and we started to see rows of little, you know, six, four to six inch plants. Do you think that would have been any different if you had established it in late summer as opposed to spring? Possibly. Yeah, that's possible. Uh, a, a late fall or a late summer establishment of, of grasses. Yeah. So um, you, you did. You did just. You didn't do a combination of legume and. Grass. No, this was just grasses, just it's seeded the same way. They were drilled in as well. So, your comment. Um, uh, the idea of drilling um, leg or grasses into an existing sod in late summer is something I'm not, I can't really speak on because I have no experience with it. Anytime we did a, a late summer establishment of forages, we did a tillage. So to get rid of that competition entirely and give that plant the best chance of getting up and, and, and establishing itself. So. I thought the Cates Farm was, isn't that like Lone Rock or where's that? Yep. Isn't that lighter soil? No, I think he's got pretty heavy soil there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A lot of light soil in that area. No, it's not oh, Lone Rock. Rock. I should say it's no. Not river spring Gr Yeah, it's yeah, Spring Creek. Uh, spring, spring Green, green no. which is the it's south of Spring the Green, even. Valley, which is pretty heavier soil. Yep. Cates Farm. Yep. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, we ought to be able to grow it real well here because we have lots of heavy soil. Okay, I try it first. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, on a limited number of acres. So, is any it, questions? Does it behave differently than the fall fescue? Because I think we have <clears throat> some folks that have history so, with that as a hay crop. And are you, when you refer to tall fescue, do you refer to what would might be considered the, an original type, uh, Kentucky 31, no, no, or an improved type? Cora, Cora, it would be one of the Cornell selections. That, okay. Yeah. So, tall fescue with the current varieties, the current improved varieties of tall fescue, um, most of them have what are considered a friendly endophyte because when, when they first said, oh, we just need to remove the endophyte, and we're going to have the best grass in the world. Well, that that relationship between the fungus and the tall fescue it, has been around for a long, long time. I'll just leave it at that. And so that improved the survivability of that grass. And when they removed that endophyte entirely, they had a grass that was like ryegrass, very easily grazed out, in in, in, um, in easily overgrazed. So when they when they reintroduced friendly endophytes that had no deleterious effect on the livestock, they improved its uh, survivability. Um, Brian, you can probably attest to this. Uh, tall fescue is still among dairymen considered a four-letter word among some because there, if given a choice, cattle still know the difference. There's a palatability issue. Still, if, if they're grazing orchard grass or meadow fescue, they're still going to prefer that over tall fescue. Um, meadow fescue does not have any of that, does not have the palatability issues that tall fescue does. But tall fescue has about 10 to 15 percent greater dry matter yield on an annual basis than, than meadow fescue, and it's going to uh, produce more in the summertime than meadow fescue. So if you're able to grow tall fescue, you should be able to grow meadow fescue? I would try say yes. Number of acres, right? Pardon? Try it on a limited number of acres. Yeah, I would try on a limited number of acres. If, if, are you here in this in this soil type here? I'd, I'd still try it. Normally, I would say yes. If you can grow tall fescue, you can grow meadow fescue. Um, uh, we grow a lot of meadow fescue. Yeah, you should be able to grow it here too. I, I'm always I'm always hesitant to say because. Some farms can be very, very different, and they're even in an area like this. If, if you're in a particular place, so, the soil so type can be different. So we've had tall fescue; it's probably 10 years old. Okay. And thick. 
Yep. Uh, and we some of sometimes it's a hay crop and sometimes it's a pasture. Okay. And and we found about this time of year they like it as well as anything. Yes. Yep. Yeah, not surprised because it identified it does not it doesn't show itself so high. So if it's if it's the old type of Kentucky 31 tall fescue, then it's not. Okay. Then a couple things are going on. Um, the fall period of growth is when grasses accumulate carbohydrates and the palatability goes up um, and, and you have cool, cool temperatures and everything that makes, it'll make the, it'll just make the grass better and tall fescue is no different than any other one so any other questions about renovation uh, oh Jeff are you going to yep. talk about using annuals have you had any experience with incorporating annuals into a pasture and then going to a new seating like next year or giving that time like an annual break. Okay. Last page. Am I, maybe that's coming. So, I'll just wait out, wait out. so the second topic okay. that so, Nadi asked me to, yes. Before you finish with the legroom, um, so it's like, I feel like it was offered the golden ring and then when you pull it away with the legrooms are going to fail over time. Uh, uh, for a long term strategy, what would you recommend then? Because, and, and why do they fail? And how can you either one, avoid it or two, mix it with something else to make it last longer because we're looking at long game plants not heavy reseedings frequently so and don't use legumes yeah <laughs> <laughs> legume so i'll paraphrase the question that the gentleman would like to know in a long-term pasture system we'd like legumes to be there all the time we don't want to have to reseed them in a renovation effort even every three or four years, okay? Let's say you have alfalfa. So the holy grail uh, of legume breeders and those that deal with white clover, red clover, and, and alfalfa is to make them persistent, okay? And I mean forever persistent. And right now in, alf in alfalfa, red clover, and white clover, that isn't happening, okay? White clover might come closest in a, in, a, in a particular soil type where it can persist vegetatively despite overgrazing or despite mismanagement or the fact that it produces seed every once in a while, which is not a true form of persistence because it's not vegetative persistence. It produces seed which germinates and you, now you have a new crop. So you may consider that sustainable, or, or you may consider that a, a, a persistent legume. Most legume breeders want to see, don't want to rely on reseeding. They want to rely on the fact that that plant will live forever. And that's not they there <laughs> with those three species. The one that is closest to is Cura Clover. Um, and, and, and Cura Clover, um, I don't have a lot of experience with growing it um, just a little bit. Ken Albrecht uh, with the University of Wisconsin, who he also just retired about two weeks ago. Um, that was his, one of his main research projects was, was looking at Cura Clover. And once established, Cura Clover can be infinitely persistent. It grows by rhizomes, um, therefore it's really, really resistant to all manner of stresses. Um, it, 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 it is very, very persistent in, in pastures. The caveat, the downside, is it takes a long, long time to establish it. And the success of establishment, you better be in that poker game for a long time because it, the seedling vigor is very, very low. And it's comp it, it, those seedlings don't compete well with all the other species that are in the pasture at the time you seed it. So the best success is, is often obtained with very, very aggressive renovation that involves some tillage um, so that you can give that pure clover seedling at least a year to, to get itself established. Uh, I've been on farms um, where I've, I've walked out on a pasture with a farmer and says, oh, I seeded that eight years ago. Now it's it's, it's really starting to grow really well, <laughs> literally. It, it, can, it, it, it grows extremely slow for the first couple of years, 
once it gets established, then it's there. But it is a long, long-term project for, for, to have Cura Clover. Brian, do you have anything else you want to add to that about the Cura Clover? I, I seated some on Larry Wilkinson's place with him. Larry's in Sauk County. And this was in 2000, 2001. And it's still there, just incredible growth, incredible production. Yep. And it's been there for 19 years. Yep. And it took him, like you said, four or five years to get down. Yeah. Reed Canary Grass and Cura. They battled it out for three or four years. Okay. And then Cura won. <laughs> Cura will eventually win, yes, yeah. over even Reed Canary Grass. So, Brian asked. I was going to add my Cura story is that I've got some of Ken Ulbricht's original remnant okay. Cura clover pastures on my farm, but they, it wasn't prominent until I had outwinter bale grazed in the field, and that impact or that severe disturbance in that field. Then when it regrew, and parts are almost 100% cure clover. Yep. And now it's spread across the farm. Yep. What year was it seeded, Rachel? <coughs> Maybe late 90s? 90s? Yeah. 90s. Late, late 90s. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. And there's spots in our yard, too, where seed had fell when they were filling the yep. cedars that are cure clover. And, and we had a, um, this is kind of off topic in terms of an organic discussion, but we had, one of our scientists had a, had a block of uh, Cura Clover that was maybe 30 feet by 20 feet, uh, replicated blocks throughout some, um, throughout some cropland, and he was using it as a, he was seeding corn into it as a living mulch. And when he got done, I, I was going to start growing grasses there, and, and we didn't want any legumes. And so I sprayed with Roundup, and we tilled it, and then we seeded the. I think I it, we saw some seedling or some some plants that came back from the Roundup. We sprayed the Roundup again. Then we seeded all of our grasses, um, and we complete tillage. We seeded the grasses. The following spring, we went out to make hay, and right in the middle where those blocks were, where those Cura clover, there was blocks 30 feet by 20 feet of Cura clover growing. And so two Roundup applications and two complete tillages operations that buried it. And so it is a persistent legume. So we have about 10 minutes for, you want to talk about annuals? Yep. And then we'll, and then we'll so the question was about annuals. So I'm going to quote Daniel Olson in Gray's Magazine. <laughs> there are really two approaches for incorporating annuals in your farm. The first is using them as a renovation tool. The second is designated a portion of your grazing acres for annuals and keeping them that way. So, um, and I, I think these really are, uh, that's, that's a really an insightful comment. And I, I show you first this, you've seen this grass, this graph of, of forage distribution probably a hundred times in your life. And the fact that in Wisconsin, our cool season grasses go crazy in the springtime. They produce a lot of dry matter. And oftentimes we fall behind, you can't keep up with it. And then, bang, we get a, a summer dry spell and they production goes way down. And then about this time of year, when we have great cool temperatures and rainfall, they produce again. And so annuals can fit into that system. And I've seen that on an organic farm um, uh, down near Lancaster, uh, most frequently where, where they, um, uh, where he uses annuals such as BMR sorghum sedan grass as a to fill in that summer gap and he intentionally has acres on his farm that he will eventually plant into perennials but he uses annuals as a as a renovation and a and a and a, a means of supplementing the feed on his on his farm and and he does two things you provide a reasonably quality forage to, to, to the cows, to the herd in the middle of summer when cool season grasses aren't producing as much. And then you do, you really benefit the cool season grasses because you get your cows off them. You're not tempted to graze a grass that's six inches tall when it's dry, which in my, my research experience is the absolute worst thing you can do to a perennial pasture is to overgraze it when it's drought stressed. Um, so the, using these annuals in that case, particularly warm season annuals, really helps management of the whole farm uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of feeding uh, and, and managing your perennial pastures. Um, 
let's see. Another way of using cool season annuals um, as, as, a, uh, as both a renovation tool or as a, uh, as a means of supplementing feed is if you intend to, uh, let's say you want to you want to completely renovate and introduce new grasses and legumes into a into a field, let's say next spring. This fall or late this summer, you would do tillage, and then you would introduce um, cool season annuals like uh, rye or brassicas. Um, what are some of the others we typically use? Oats, triticale, yep. And and you would provide then cattle with a, a source of feed throughout this throughout this fall period, and in some cases in the spring. All right. And then when those when those forages are done producing next spring, early next spring, you do tillage or you, you drill into them, and you start over with a perennial system. So that's an, that's another way of of, uh, of using annuals in that in that system. I've not done a lot of that work. Um, I've let other farmers do it for me. Basically, I've been on farms and watched what producers do with with um, annuals, whether they're warm season or cool season. Um, the originality and creativity never ceases to amaze me. About well, I've I've got I need forage for a month and a half. I'm gonna, <coughs> I'm going to put something in real quick, which came up, somebody called me, uh, I can't remember who called me this spring and said, I've had the worst winter kill I have ever seen on orchard grass, and this is an organic farm. What am I going to do? I, I need some forage. I said, well, I just get some manual ryegrass and I drill it in right now. And when it, when it starts coming up, um, you know, if you can put any kind of nitrogen fertilizer or manure on it, do so. But something like annual ryegrass is going to grow like crazy in the springtime. It won't do so well in the summer, and it'll be gone in one year. But at least it's a means of getting some forage in your cows when if you've got really bad winter kill. So, any other questions, Nadia? That pretty much. You can have some questions. Yeah, that's any good. other questions? Yeah, questions? What about when you're talking persistence of legumes? What about birds with tree fall? So trefoil is another one of those um, legumes which has really low seedling vigor, um, and it is very soil type specific legume. I would say more so than any of our other legumes. It does well in in um, in acidic soils, poorly drained soils, and so it's more difficult to establish just because it has low seedling vigor, and and grazing management is critical for it because it, it relies, it, it doesn't store any of the carbohydrates in its roots, it doesn't have a, a real hardy uh, root system, but where, it, where it's adapted and where I've seen it grow best is across the northern parts of Wisconsin, uh, then, it, then it'll persist. But grazing management is an issue. Grazing residue, I often think about uh, residue height being important with grasses. That's one of the legumes where it's, it's really critical to leave a six to eight inch residue because it, it's going to regrow from leaf area that remains after after the grazing event and not on, on stored carbohydrates. I'm new to the grazing thing. So, okay. so if I was going to start off from scratch and I got an organic farm. What's scratch? What do you mean by scratch? Do you have a pasture or not? No, it's all cropland right now. What kind of cropland? Corn and beans and alfalfa. Okay. Wheat, barley. Okay. And I want to start from scratch here. Um, is best to seed it all in the spring? And then how long, if you would make hay out of it, forages and not graze it for till the following fall? Good, bad? I don't know. It's like starting an uh, organic grazing dairy from scratch. He's the kind of guy we want here today. Yeah. <laughs> so the question is, he's starting from scratch, literally. Yeah. And you've got corn, soybean. Alfalfa and... there, sir. It's, it's good fertility ground. Okay. Fertility's not an issue. This is a little outside my league. Um, and I'm quite willing to say what, that 
that I'm not quite sure where I would start with this. Um, I would be hesitant if, 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 if the residue of the, let's just say corn and bean residue is, is manageable and there isn't too much of on the ground, then I would be hesitant to apply a lot of tillage just because, boy, the weeds are going to come like crazy, I would think. Is it was it an organic farm before? Or is it organic? I, I am served from organic now, yes. And well, what, how long it? has it been organic? Four years. Okay, before that it was conventional? Yep. Okay. Would you till and then and then plant, or would you just I drill into it? I don't know what you answer, because that's your fault. <laughs> 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 There's also another person that's a good resource, um, Joanna Newman, and okay. she's at oh. UW River Falls, and I'll get you, I have something here from her actually I can give you. But um, uh. I think that, yeah, I think she's talked to producers about this before too, and just a whole host of things that you, know, you could try, you but I think baby. Yeah, new seeding. How much do you usually baby it in your so advice? So, yeah. if, if you, Okay. Wow. I mean, we had a so new seeding of pasture that I took out of soybeans. That mm -hmm. I didn't even. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. paid it once mm -hmm. the whole season. Maybe. With an old nurse crab. So, mm -hmm. And I wish I would have grazed it earlier. Speak so, up, Rachel. Okay. Speak up. I said I had a field that was a sandy soil that came out of beans, and then I planted the grassworks grazing mix in mm -hmm. with an oats nurse crop. And I didn't take anything off of until later in the year, but I wish I would have gone in earlier and grazed it, probably in June, you know, when it was all coming up, it would. And I've talked to other people at Marshfield and stuff about babying, new seeding, and that I, you don't need to baby it as much right. as you would think. And particularly if you've planted, if, if you use a small grain as a, as a nurse crop or as a companion yep. crop with yep. it, that's even more important is, is to graze, to get that to off, because it will we'll really compete today. well. Pardon? We'll have some of that. I got some new seeding we can and look at. Okay. Okay. Beautiful. So, so the ground you're on, is that light ground, heavier this is ground? This plain field sand. No, I'm talking oh, to him, sorry. Oh, I got all heavy ground. All heavy. All heavy. heavy, flat ground. Sloping? Or slope. Contoured strips. Okay. Um, so if you do tillage, yep. then I would use a companion crop mm -hmm. with it. And I have enough cattle to take the oats off, you know, after it's heads out in the milk stage, you know, so it doesn't smother anything out, bale it up for feed, that's not a problem. Okay. That's not an issue. I would probably, if you can, I would get to it even before, before that, the dough stage or milk stage, yep. I would even get, if you can, because uh, the longer you wait, the more competition that small grain is going to provide with those, those seedlings underneath. And remember, what your final goal is a perennial pasture not 500 pounds more dry matter of oats. <laughs> Your final goal is a perennial pasture with, with perennial grasses and legumes that are successfully established. Um, if, if I were doing it, um, I would probably do, perform some tillage. Mm -hmm. And then I would use, and then I would broadcast um, my grasses and my legumes, and then I'd come back and pack it. You would seed them all with a brilliant seeder? Yes, that, you could do that too. I have that kind of equipment now. It's not, okay. Not I, yes, I would do that. I think it's going to matter with the tillage. You're just doing it at once. Yep. You know. Yep. I think, I, I think with the tillage, you're going to get a better seed contact. Soil I think seed you will contact. too. I just didn't know how much. Yeah, I did, I've seen bean fields that are just like level and like this driveway, and you can drill into them quite easily, yeah. but I've also seen cases where some tillage would work better. And not knowing what what you have, I think tillage would help. Uh, as he said, you get, produce a better seed bed, and if you have a brilliant, absolutely. You're you know, and I have both boxes on the brilliant. You know. Okay, then you're in good shape. You know, you can put the larger seed grass in the back, and the alfalfa yep. and smaller ones in the front. Not an issue. And so your other question was, should you try it all in the spring or fall or both? Yeah. My preference would be do a little both. I would try because um, there, there are good reasons, and, and, and again, it's like you're playing poker. Sometimes you really get a good hand, and what you seed in the spring is fabulous. Other times, if you seed in the springtime, and you've got a whole bunch of seedlings about this tall, and it quits raining in July or something like that, those seedlings can be under a lot of stress to make it through the whole year. 
if you don't get in early enough, if you have heavy ground, uh, and don't start the process early enough. Um, so that'd be my preference. I don't know what, what your thoughts are. Yeah, I have Joanna's old presentation here, and it basically gives advantages for the spring and advantages for late summer, early fall. Yeah, sure. there are advantages to fall and, and spring spring grazing, or spring establishment. What about his alfalfa? Does he have any grasses in his alfalfa, or is he starting to you want to need to incorporate grass? In yeah, do you, your alfalfa is, how, how good a stand of alfalfa? Really, really good. Okay. I, I, used, I used to milk cows, and then I got out of milk cows, and I might want to get back in. Well, then I would keep that for winter food. Yep. I mean, alfalfa, there's, no, there's nothing that's going to give you more milk than alfalfa. Sure, sure, yeah, sure. I wouldn't go. Sure, but it's in the area that I like to graze, you know, so I don't know how difficult it is, you know, to flash graze alfalfa, so to speak, kind of, you know, if it's, it's, if it's, it's in it's that a monoculture. Area. Huh? It's a monoculture, it's just, it's no grass, it's just straight there, There's some grass in it. I planted like five pounds of grass with the alfalfa. So over time, that, as the alfalfa persistence, as it starts dying out, that grass will express itself oh, sure, more sure. and more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not knowing how much grass is there, you you can drill some more into it if you if you wished. Uh, meadow fescue would be a great choice for that, um, because of it, it, it its palatability is going to be very good, and they won't leave it compared to you know to, to, to eating the, the alfalfa. Um, We're going to see some of this planting less does out pasture when you do with oats. And maybe you should. Uh, Give Jeff a round of applause. Yeah, you're, both of you can we're done. Out and yeah, we're yeah. So, give this guy a round of applause too. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing everything wrong today. <laughs> Thank you very much.